nuestro instrumento de la vuestra paz. Lord, make me, make me an instrument of your peace. Lasciarlo seminare l'amore Where there is hatred Let me so
let us all welcome Dr. Rebecca D. Miranda, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, for her opening remarks. A blissful day, everyone. The Student Research Colloquium is a tradition in Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite. With the theme, EAC at 50, Celebrating Lives of Excellence, Service, and Virtue, it communicates an especially important message to all the stakeholders. The institution has seen the realization and the translation of the core values to every Emilian. This research colloquium is conducted not just to comply with the requirements of accreditation and regulating bodies, but to provide a pool of additional or new knowledge which will improve lives. The research outputs are truly relevant to the needs of the challenging times and to improve the operational processes of the institution. It may be utilized as well by other institutions for benchmarking purposes. This colloquium is an avenue for students to be more creative, innovative, and inquisitive. Life after the pandemic is entirely different. With this activity, it will serve as a catalyst for our students to venture into the unknown. It will further motivate our students to engage more in relevant researches. With all the presentations lined up today, I am sure that this will be a very fruitful and beneficial endeavor. Without further ado, I welcome you to this student research colloquium with the theme EAC at 50 celebrating lives of excellence, service, and virtue. Thank you, and have a pleasant day. Rationale of the Student Research Colloquium. The Research and Development Office annually conducts the undergraduate thesis of the year and the Student Research Colloquium. This is to provide opportunities to the Emilio Aguinaldo College Cavite students to showcase their scholarly outputs in their field of specialization through research. This research event fosters engaging environment to the student researchers to promote multidisciplinary collaborations among the Emilio Aguinaldo College Cavite students. I am now presenting the criteria for judging and selecting the undergraduate thesis of the year. There are two awards to be given in this year's Student Research Colloquium. The undergraduate thesis of the year for the academic year 2022 to 2023 under the descriptive category and the undergraduate thesis of the year for the academic year 2022 to 2023 under the experimental category. The research papers will be evaluated by the panel of evaluators in the following areas. Organization, 15%. Content, 45%, and presentation, 40% for a total of 100%. Let me now introduce the panel of evaluators. Our first panel, she earned her Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering and Master in Information Technology at STI Southwoods. She acquired her Doctor of Philosophy in Management Major in Information Technology at Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Calamba. Her research interests are Information Technology, Information Management, Engineering Management, Industrial Technology, and Computing. Currently, she is the Campus Designation Chair at Cavite State University, Carmona Campus. Let us welcome Dr. Regine G. Hernandez. Our next panel of evaluator obtained his Doctor in Business Administration from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines and currently in its final stage to complete his Doctor of Philosophy major in Educational Management. He has been a research enthusiast since 2018, presented his researches to various conferences and has published research articles in journal and magazines of national and international publications company. 
He was also invited to be one of the panel of evaluators during the international training on action research and plenary presentation in Virginia, USA. Currently, he is the Assistant Dean of the College of Business, Entrepreneurship, and Accountancy at Rizal Technological University. Let us welcome Dr. Jesse F. Sergote. Our last panel of evaluator took her Doctor of Philosophy in Technology Education at Rizal Technological University. Her research interests are in food technology and community extension services. She is a recipient of the Batobalani Awards 2017 and presently the Director of the Extension and Training Services Office at Bataan Peninsula State University Main Campus. Let us welcome Dr. Bernadette B. Gabor. Let us now proceed to the presentation of the student researchers. Living through a pandemic has changed nearly every aspect of our lives. Our jobs, education, and lifestyles have all been affected. And due to the abruptness of the changes and all the uncertainty that came with it, there have really been pretty big challenges that we were left to deal with, particularly university professors who, according to Fernandez Vargas et al. 2021, are in a very demanding profession with high social responsibility. Thus, we conducted this research not only to help identify solutions to the current shadow of workplace issues, but also to hopefully inspire and motivate other educators who may be going through something similar. Here in our problem statement, it is a description of research cup which researchers aims to answer. Also, it clearly communicates our research objectives. So we have three statements of the problem, and these are the following. Why did the participants suffer from remote work burnout? How is the participant's work performance affected by their burnout? How did the participant recover from remote work burnout? For the theoretical framework, we have two. The first one is the Social Cognitive Theory by Bandura, 1977, which states that people with lower self-efficacy are more likely to experience burnout. The second is Bakker et al. 2001's JDR model, which contends that burnout occurs when there is an imbalance between an individual's job demands and coping resources, one of which is self-efficacy. Here we have the final set of beneficiaries, the faculty's family members. We hope to enlighten them regarding faculty burnout and help them interact with their burnt out relatives in ways that help facilitate recovery. Next is school administrators. We hope to help them in establishing academic institutions to promote job satisfaction among us professors. Following that is the Commission in Higher Education, or CHAD. We hope that our study will provide insights that will facilitate the development of an effective curriculum for both Filipino learners and educators alike. For the scope and limitations, our study will be confined in remote teaching college professors at Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite, ages 25 to 50, as according to Aladag 2018, that is the age range when burnout is prevalent. This study will be conducted in the academic year of 2021 to 2022 to 2022 to 2023. Overall variables such as gender and social demographic factors are outside the scope of our study, as several researchers found conflicting results contradicting each other. As for the number of years teaching, it is of less importance as most of the professors are new and unfamiliar with virtual teaching, which in turn creates an equal amount of challenges regardless of their years of service. Rosanna is 2022. Next is the definition of terms by Ms. Manco. For a clear, concise, detailed explanation of definition of terms, these are the following. Burn up is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. The personalization is a negative impersonal sense or an extreme detachment from the job. Emotional exhaustion is associated with an experience of fatigue or a gradual loss of energy. Personal accomplishment refers to the individual sense of achievement at work. Remote teaching professor that in spite of the crisis disseminate lectures decently to the use of communication technologies. Remote work where employees are required to work from home amidst the pandemic. The related literatures I'm about to present are organized into themes. First up is the new normal, the era where all the schools in the Philippines closed down, said by UNICEF. Then came remote learning, mentioned by Ancheta and Ancheta. Afterwards, Alman et al. mentioned numerous factors that can affect distance learning. Next theme is remote teaching, where trust in Warren's study revealed that the instructors are having trouble keeping up with remote teaching. 61% of them found it challenging. That result was supported by a survey from Educos, finding that out of 11,141 instructors, 91% refused to teach in a full online environment. 
Next team is Burnout, where Fraga traced the term Burnout, coined by Freud and Berger in 1970. Now, Queen and Harbing described burnout as a psychological syndrome caused by job-specific physical and emotional weariness from stress. Next theme is burnout among professors, where Harmson et al. stated that teaching was indeed a stressful profession. Now, Garcia Gonzalez and others mentioned that higher education is where burnout is most widespread. The last theme is recovery from burnout. Now, Maslach and later stated that burnout experiences and coping techniques are unique to each person. Salmonen et al. found that burnout recovery paths are highly individual and heterogeneous. Finally, Weiss and Aguilar mentioned that pressuring a burnt-out employee to change their lifestyle and behavior are ineffective. It is instead in the improvement of social and or organizational strategies that burnt-out workers, just like professors, could recover. This study used an intrinsic explanatory in a single case study which we conducted at Emilio Ginaldo College, Cavite. Participant was chosen using a proposed sampling, and through this, we develop a criteria that a willing participant should meet. Ideally, the participant must be a college remote working professor at AACC, ages 25 to 50, who prior to the study had had self-reported burnout experiences characterized by obtaining moderate to high degree scores of occupational exhaustion in the personalization and low degree of personal accomplishment in Maslow burnout inventory and has already recovered from it as seen by its inverse score. Fortunately, the criteria was met by one chosen participant which, according to Young and Kasi 2019, was enough to yield the data needed. The entire procedure was completely web-based. We posted a call for participants via Facebook, and a willing participant received a Google form that directed them to the informed consent form along with a qualifying test, which is the MDI. Considering the data triangulation, the qualified participant was subjected to a series of tests, 20 statement tests, 60-minute semi-structured interview, and on a later date, repertory grid. The entire duration of the session lasted for two hours via Google Meet. The rep kit was constructed based on the transcribed interview. Data gathered in the first session were analyzed. Following the temporal element of the case study, the researchers conducted similar procedures with identical data gathering tools 30 days after the first session. Data gathered in the second session were also analyzed, and when everything was done, the team compared the accumulated results derived from the two data sets to form a third analysis. The research instruments used in this study were MDI, Educator Survey, PSP, Repertory Grid, and Validated Semi-Structured Interview. Data gathered were analyzed using thematic analysis. For the 20 statement test, majority of responses to both sessions were categorized as C-mode, which goes to say that the participant is reflective. Most of the C-mode responses during the first session were negative statements, which inferred that the professor has a negative outlook on their professional life. Prior negative statements showed a reduced sense of personal accomplishment and a hint of depersonalization, which are two of the three dimensions of burnout. Therefore, higher chances of burnout were perceived to the first set of statements provided by the professor. However, during the second session, majority of CMOD responses became positive statements, revealing a positive outlook on the professional life, accompanied by the increased personal accomplishment and a dramatic drop of the personalization, which according to Maslach, burnout inventory reduces the likelihood of professors burnout. Now for the presentation of results from both interview sessions in connection with our first SOP, we have identified three master themes, the first one being personal issues, a clear indication of work-life imbalance, which according to Tugsell and Algen 2017, as well as Moama et al. 2022, is a predictor of burnout, especially during times of crisis such as a COVID-19 pandemic. Although an additional theme emerged in the second session, both datasets revealed that heavy workload contributed to the participants' remote work burnout. These findings align with the correlational study of Jemua and others 2021, which shows that increased workload heightens burnout among professors. The final master theme is labeled Abrupt Shift, which discusses the challenges encountered by the participants due to the forced adoption of remote learning. In support of this is a study by Mosley et al. 2022, where they argued that rather than remote teaching per se, 
It is a sudden shift to remote teaching that could be the primary cause of stress and burnout among university professors. Aligning the results with three dimensions of burnout identified by the WHO and MBI, findings from the two data sets imply that exhaustion is one of the effects of burnout on professors' work performance, supporting the study of Muslim authors 2022, which reported a high level of burnout in a remote teaching setup, with 40.3% expressing physical exhaustion and 37.4% emotional exhaustion. Next, we've identified a personalization, which covers a participant's implicit and explicit displays of loss of empathy and other related manifestations. In sync with this are the findings of Wang et al. 2020, where they discovered that depersonalization, behaviors reflecting this such as callousness, Increased cynicism and so on are very common among burnt out professionals. The third master team found in the two data sets was reduced personal accomplishment, discussing how burnout experiences negatively affected their personal efficacy, supporting Johnson and others 2020, claiming that a reduced sense of personal accomplishment was more common in an online classroom than in face to face teaching setup. Now on to the third SOP, the first of the three master themes we've identified is self compassion. Under this are specific demonstrations of it, which according to the findings of Montero Marine et al. 2016, as well as Hassem and Hussein now in 2020, is a possible protective factor for burnout. The second theme presented across the data sets was the healthy lifestyle, which covers participants' preventive strategies to recover from remote work burnout. The paper's findings are similar to the cross-sectional study of the Slavin Skin and Others 2021, where burnout recovery was found negatively associated with unhealthy lifestyle and positively associated with active physical activities, social engagement, and pharmacological intervention. Lastly, we have goal orientation, which covers the participants' disposition towards goal achievement. This is supported by the study of Supervia and Salivary 2020, where they discovered that goal orientation not only encourages faculty commitment, but also helps to prevent burnout syndrome and promotes affirmation of adaptive behaviors. Grab grade A from both sessions show that personal relationships, heavy workload, abrupt transition to remote teaching, and repetitive work are all contributing factors in the development of burnout, which were in sync to the findings of Ozimir and Demir, Salmela Aro et al. and Ray Botella. Grab grade B through both sessions, along with the studies of Lee and Trinity Dodge, show that dissatisfaction and insecurity to do work well were the main affected factors of teaching performance. Rep grade C through two datasets show that self-love, healthy lifestyle, seeking professional help, and goal orientation are all factors that help the participant recover, which were parallel to the findings of Kemper et al., Sokal et al., Zabu and Jagodix, and Yildizil. After a thorough analysis of the research findings, we were able to draw the following conclusions. Given that the participants' burnout has been linked to work-life interference, overwhelming job demands, and the emergency shift to remote teaching, which are pandemic-induced circumstances beyond their control, we conclude that the COVID-19 pandemic predisposed the participant to remote work burnout. Next, we have also concluded that the observed decline in the participant's work performance was caused by the extraordinary pandemic working conditions, which created an ideal environment for burnout to emerge and thrive based on our theoretical frameworks. Lastly, we deduced that the participant's burnout recovery was made possible by their own unique characteristics, such as their reflective nature, and self-compassionate behavior, both of which are person-specific variables, proving that there is indeed no one-size-fits-all solution to burnout. Based on the findings and conclusion, the following recommendations are hereby presented. For the professors, we believe that because burnout is a very unique personal experience, the key to prevent it or recover from it is to engage in behaviors that can combat its manifestation and help replenish their coping resources, such as practicing self-care and having compassion for others and for oneself. Students, we encourage them to educate themselves on faculty burnout and be mindful when interacting with their professors so they do not contribute to their professor's burnout and help facilitate recovery. School administrator, we urge them to take meaningful actions against burnout such as developing clear policies that will improve the working conditions of professors and prevent resource depletion. For the Commission of Higher Education, we believe that it would be extremely beneficial if they could develop a concrete and long-term plan to address remote teaching burnout. Future researchers, they could try adjusting some aspects of the study in order to explore other uncharted areas.
good afternoon to our fellow judges and today we are going to present our title Accessibility of Healthcare Among the Residents of Barangay Triwa or Rosario Cavite Towards the Management of Upper Respiratory Tract Infection in Young Adult Health. My name is Daniel Ngakaya and with our, my fellow members, Jocelyn Comodas and Sir Dina Jowali. Our contents of this research is introduction, methodology, results, and discussion. First for our discussion is our background of the study. So according to Korsenewski et al. in 2014, respiratory infections are some of the most common health encountered by travelers visiting tropical and subtropical countries. Also according to Heiken and Ruskanen in 2006, that most URTIs happen during in the rainy seasons in, in tropical countries. Upper respiratory tract infections affect the nostrils, pharynx, larynx, and large airways. And it can be trans transmitted from one individual to another by inhaling respiratory particles from sneezes and coughs. So in addition, according to Yun, et al. in 2021 stated the current acute URTI management strategies focus on symptom relief and preventing URTI virus transmission. So in the leading illness in the Philippines in 2019 was acute respiratory, upper respiratory infection which affected approximately 1 to 1.16 million people. And according to Salvacion in 2022, goal 3 of sustainable development goals facilitates well-being and healthy lifestyle choices for people of all ages. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, one of the most major difficulties in achieving sustainable development goals in vast differences in health care access. Not all residents of every barangay are aware of their capability in accessing health care services within their community. Some may be aware but have limited access to it. Less access for individual health services provided by the government and availability of other services, which is important especially when talking about health ser services. So for our statement of the problem, this study will determine access Civility of residents within the following specific objective is to assess healthcare with access within the community as to hospital availability, availability of hospital transport, appointment for health barangay, communication, technology, financial accessibility, and to identify healthcare services provided in a specific individual that shows signs and symptoms of an upper respiratory to determine action and healthcare provider in early treatment of upper respiratory tract infection to identify the factors that affect the community from receiving and accessing healthcare services. And for our conceptual framework, the residents of Barangay Triwawa is the focus of the study where we can determine the accessibility of healthcare through the results of information that was collected. It indicated the quality of healthcare accessibility in the barangay has met the standard for the residents. By this, researcher recommends to continue in providing healthcare services and support in management of URT. So for our methodology, is the research design. Quantitative methods with descriptive survey, sample taken of 344 participants using population taken from Consus 2015 within age predicted to be young adult in resulting in 2,441 population predicted. And for our research local, uh, the study was conducted in the Barangay Triwawa, specifically in near quarters Julagan 2 and Sapa 4. Our research participants and respondents, young adult age 18 to 25. And we covered approximately 344 respondents, including those who test positive for URTI or are at risk of developing it. Our sampling technique is non-probability sampling, purposive sampling, and our data gathering procedure is on-site. And within our pilot testing, was done in Barangay Punta, Tanza, and was done with no issues, which led the researchers implement with their questionnaires to the Barangay Triwawa and was also validated by a licensed respiratory therapist and a research coordinator of school and retired officer from Tawi-Tawi Regional Agricultural College before being used as a foundation for the data collection in our study and undergone ethical review before the distribution. And for our research in instrument, the surveys and questionnaires were based on a previous study conducted by a researcher, European Patient Form Survey Access to Healthcare Template, and modified by the researcher, which contains the demogra demographic profile of the respondents, such as sex, age, years of residency. These tools are existing as a guide for, for the survey sample. In our data analysis, we, we hired, or the researcher hired a statistician which he is a performer professor in Cagayan State University in La University Lalo and to analyze the data and to collect frequency counts and percentages surveys which are analyzed using descriptive statistics such as simple frequency distribution percentages and percentage frequency distribution. Next for the results which Jose Comodas will discuss. 
I will present the result of our research and the result of the survey that we gathered. For our result, in our demographic profile, we incorporate patient details like sex, age, marital status, and barangay residency using a pie graph. In the first graph, it demonstrates the gender with 182 female respondent with equivalent of 53% and male of 162 respondent with 47%. In the second graph, it demonstrates the marital status, the percentage of respondent who are single is 134, which is about 68%, marriage is 79 or 23%, divorce or separated of 16 or 4.7%, and widowed of 12 respondent equivalent to 3.5%. When it comes to age, majority of our respondents who answer our survey is range from age of 19 to 20 years old with 124 respondents equivalent to 36% and the list was 25 years old with 10.8%. Next figure was the, was the large percentage of residency was those who live in the barangay for more than 9 years or 12 months and beyond with 296 respondents equivalent to 86%. In hospital availability, we conducted a three set of questions to be answered by our participants. The first question is how difficult it was to actually obtain healthcare services they needed a year. The result revealed that majority of them answered moderate with 56.98% followed by easy, very easy, difficult and last was very difficult. For question B, they read access to information of hospital and available healthcare services sources such as school, work, hospital, and internet. In this graph, it shows that most of them answered average in regards of all sources. Next question was if they agreed with the items or information about available healthcare services with hospital and centers. Majority of them answered yes in terms of easy to find, easy accessible, easy to understand, and useful. Is the availability for hospital transport? Most of the respondents then answered yes with 64.5% in the question of is emergency transport available for all residents and 2.6% answered no. For availability of a scheduled appointment for health barangay, in the past 12 months, majority of the respondents did not experience any significant delay in accessing medicine, medical equipment, and diagnostic tests, except in accessing treatment intervention with 54.7% yes. With appointment with nurses, primary care, doctor specialists, and help from social services, mostly answer was there no significant delay. Does health center help or create with the signs and symptoms listed below? For ear ache and sinuses, most of the responses then answer no with 65.7% and 52.9% when it comes to common cold, common cold, throat ache, and cough. Majority of them answered yes with the highest percentage of 442 to 64.5%. Does the, does the provider meet their expectation in terms of further examination, information, and reassurance and medication for pain relief? The highest percentage was yes, with an average of 45.6% to 66.9%. And when it comes to nose rapids for cough and referral to hospital, most of the respondents answered yes that, they provide, that, that the providers met their expectation. Respondent primary mode of communication was by telephone with 56.5%, followed by walk-in with 55.5%, and this percentage was using social media and web page. If they receive messages from healthcare providers when, they are up, when there are updates, majority of the respondents Majority of the answers sometimes with 36.7% um, pay healthcare the providers reachable when they call asking for the health issue problem. Majority of them answer sometimes with 34.5%. And they always reminded about. Majority of them answered sometimes with 35%. For the financial accessibility, most of the respondents answered sometimes to the question if they can afford a primary care doctor, specialized healthcare provider, provider, hospital, medicine, and medical equipment. And with the highest percentage of 45.9%, sometimes participants experience a financial difficulty as a result of spending on healthcare. In the past 12 months, 74.7% responded to reduce their spending on essential needs such as food or clothing to be able to cover healthcare costs, and 25.3% answered no. Of 24 respondents, only 59 or 17.2% answered they that they postponed healthcare visit because of cost. The largest part with 110 equivalent to 32% answered that they never postponed healthcare visit. The large part answered that they agreed with the statement with the statement of my healthcare costs are covered to a sufficient degree by my healthcare system, whether it is stock-based or social insurance-based, with 37.8% and 16.2% answered yes that they need the resource to a uh, private or complementary health insurance in order to cover their health care costs. So now let's discuss for the last part of our thesis, which is the discussion or the summary of our thesis. So for the summary of our thesis, so female than male, we have uh, participants that is great, greater is the female than male, and mostly the age are 19 to 20 years old, and most of them are single. For their residency, um, they live more than a year in their residence. So for the availability of hospital in this area, um, they receive a positive reviews. Residents were able to get this um, availability as a, re as a residence in the area. And many of the residents were able to access emergency transport when it is needed. Most respondents were able to visit hospital due to signs and symptoms and meet expectation for its actions. So for those who have um, upper respiratory tract infections, they were able to visit um, hospital centers uh, to to check for their um, disease and also for early treatment. And for the sources they use to communicate, um, they use telephones or they also use walk-ins for, for communication with the healthcare provider. So for the satisfaction and security and continuity of care, residents have also said that um, they, they feel or they have a good um, 
they have a good satisfaction and security towards their um towards the care of their um health care and also they receive social support and health care support such as like that um in their government in their government then for the conclusion of this um, research, general accessibility of healthcare services in the barangay was enough to meet the needs of the majority of its residents. And access to healthcare services in the barangay was not a problem at all. And since they promised to offer each resident fair and unbiased approach when it comes to healthcare, which means that uh, most of the residents in the barangay receive um, equality regarding um, healthcare, healthcare accessibility. For our recommendations, um, we have a continue providing individual needs for healthcare services and also improvement of accessing healthcare services and giving empathy to my minority of the residents. And also for future re researchers, um, they may add more criteria to study the accessibility of healthcare in the barangay to further explore the um, accessibility of healthcare in the barangay. So that's all for our research. Thank you. Good day everyone, I am Kristin Faye W. Alvarez, fourth year student from Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite School of Criminology, and I am here to discuss our research entitled Alternative Dispute Resolution, a Key to Peace and Order in the Barangay Level. To give a background on why we conducted this study, on the article written by Tadyar, he mentioned that as a result of indiscriminate filing and delayed processing of cases in the Court of Justice, Court dockets have been excessively and unjustifiably clogged. Hundreds of thousands of cases are still pending resolution or action. Consequently, some cases have taken as long as generation to be resolved. For this reason, we seek to answer the following questions. What are the different alternative dispute resolution program applied in the barangay level? To what extent is the application of ADR in the barangay level? What is the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay? Is there a significant relationship between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR in the barangay? And lastly, is there a significant difference in the extent of application and the level of success of ADR in the three barangays. For the hypothesis, we have two. First, there is no significant relationship between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR in the barangay. And second, there is no significant difference between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR in the three barangays. For the theoretical framework, this research is guided by conflict transformation theory by John Paul Lederach. According to this theory, all conflicts are natural, normal, and continuous dynamic within human relationship, in which the conflict has rhythm and pattern and can be eliminated through the use of active techniques such as conciliation and mediation. For the conceptual framework, in the illustration, there are two variables. First is the extent of application and the next is the level of success of ADR. The two-headed arrow shows the significant difference of the three barangays in the extent of application and the level of success of ADR. For the significance of the study, this will benefit the barangay residents, courts, law enforcement agencies, local government unit, Luponta Gabapamayapa, current researchers, and the future researchers. For the scope and limitation, this study is covered and is limited to parties under ADR and Luponta Gabapamayapa in Barangay Sabang, Barangay Salitran 2, and Barangay Sampalo 1. Now for, altern for review of related literature and studies, we have Alternative Dispute Resolution. Under Republic Act No. 9285, or also known as the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of 2004, which defined alternative dispute resolution system as any method of proceeding that is used to settle disputes or controversies other than by the adjudication of the preceding judge of the court. Next is... Under Barangay Justice System, we have Republic Act 7160 or the Local Government Code of 1991, which established that Barangay Justice System that is based on the Katarungan Pambarangay Manual that promotes community-based conflict resolution. But moving on with the method methodology, we have for research design, descriptive correlational research, 
And for our research local, the study has been conducted in selected barangays in the city of Dasmariñas, Cavite, namely Barangay Sabang, Barangay Sampaloc 1, and Barangay Salitran 2. For the research participants, we have 349 participants that is shown in the table, which comprises of 32 Lupon Tagapamayapa, which is 15 from Barangay Sabang, 10 from Barangay Salitran 2, and 7 from Barangay Sampaloc 1. We also have 317 parties who have undergone alternative dispute resolution program in their respective barangays, 105 from Barangay Sabang, 113 from Barangay Salitran 2, and 99 from Barangay Sampaloc 1. For, us, for our sampling method, this study utilized a combination of three different sampling techniques, such as purposive quota and snowball sampling. For our data gathering techniques, first we submitted a letter to barangay captains and coordinated with the barangay for the schedule of the administration of questionnaires. After that, we conducted a validity and reliability test and we secured a consent form of each respondent. And after that, we personally administered the questions and finally, we tallied and summarized the gathered data. For our research instrument, we adapted and modified the questionnaires from the study of Pajarillo 2018, which is entitled Effectiveness of Conciliation Process, a Practical Way of Delivering Justice to Assess the Extent of Application of ADR at the Barangay. While from the study of Blue and Devanadero 2017, which is entitled Assessment of the Center of Local Governance Implementation of the Barangay Justice Service System Project in Mindanao, Philippines, to assess the level of success of ADR applied at the barangay level. For our data analysis, to analyze the different ADR programs applied in the barangay level, frequency and percentage distribution were used. To analyze the extent of application and the level of success of ADR, mean was used. To analyze the significant relationship between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR, the spearman rock correlation coefficient was used. And lastly, to determine if there is a significant difference in the extent of application and the level of success of ADR in the three barangay, the cruz cal wallis test was used. Moving on with the results of the study, on table one, shows the alternative dispute resolution programs applied in the barangay with multiple choices. The overall result shows that mediation is the most applied program in the three barangays at 78.13%, followed by conciliation at 62.50% and arbitration at 34.38%. Next, for table two, this shows the extent of application of ADR at the barangay level as perceived by the, by the Lupon Tagapamayapa. Data revealed that the ADR applied in the three barangays is highly applied with an overall weighted mean of 3.95. This implies that Lupon Tagapamayapa in the selected barangays are con consciously discharging their functions while continuously making more efforts in rendering excellent service to the people for a more sound and successful conciliation. While according to the parties, data shows that the parties perceived ADR to be highly applied in the three barangays with an overall weighted mean of 3.52. Next table shows the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay. Data revealed that the ADR applied in three barangays are, as perceived by the Lupon Tagapamayapa, was very successful with an overall weighted mean of 3.91. However, the overall weighted mean assessed by the parties is slightly lower than the weighted mean perceived by the Lupon Tagapamayapa. This illustrates that parties have different perception regarding the level of success of ADR. The Lupon Tagapamayapa shows different level of success of ADR that deviates from what the parties expected. For Table 4, illustrates the relationship between the extent of application and the level of success of ADR applied in the barangays as perceived by the Lupon Tagapamayapa. Data shows that the p-value of 0 0.159 is greater than the alpha level of significance of 0 0.05. Hence, the null hypothesis is accepted. Therefore, there is no significant relationship between the two variables. For Table 5, 
This reveals the relationship between the extent of application and the level of success of ADR applied at the barangay as perceived by the parties. The data shows that the p-value of 0, 0.0 is less than the alpha level of significance of 0, 0.05. Hence, null hypothesis is rejected. Therefore, there is there is a significant relationship between the two variables. This implies that when the ADR procedures are highly applied, the higher the chances of, for the ADR to be successful. For Table 6, this shows the significant difference in the extent of application and the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay as perceived by the Luponta de Pamayapa. As shown, the, the p-value of 0 0.949 is greater than the alpha level of significance at 0 0.05. Hence, there is no significant difference in the extent of application of ADR in the three barangays. This means that the three barangays attained a similar evaluation of the extent of application of ADR, which is highly applied. And lastly, for our last table, table 7, this reveals the significant difference in the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR applied in the bar barangay as perceived by the parties. In terms of the extent of application of ADR, the p-value of 0 0.001 is less than the alpha level of significance of 0 0.05 Hence, the null hypothesis is rejected. Therefore, there is there is a significant re relation. Th there is a significant difference in the extent of application of ADR in the barangays. Now, for the conclusion and recommendation, alternative dispute resolution program. Most of the data gathered in the three barangays shows that the mediation is the most applied program, followed by conciliation and arbitration. This revealed that the three barangays properly executed the different ADR programs at the barangay level to maintain peace and order within the barangay and to help the decongestion of court dockets. For the extent of application of ADR, most of the findings answered by the Luponta Kapamayapa as well as by the parties in the three barangays resulted in highly applied in relation to extent of application of ADR at the barangay level. The assessment found that the Luponta Kapamayapa adequately implemented the application of ADR at the barangay level which provided proper service to the people in accordance with the law. Now, for level of success of the ADR, most of the findings on the level of success applied in the three barangays indicated a very similar, a very successful rating, which shows that the community has confidence in the barangay justice system through the judicious application of ADR programs in handling conflicts before going to court, which is quite timely consuming and costly. For the relationship between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay, the overall finding from the parties implied that there is a significant relationship between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay indicates that when the implementation of ADR is, is highly applied, the ADR becomes successful. For the SO. P5, significant difference in the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR applied in the three barangays. According to the parties, there is a significant difference between the extent of application of ADR and the level of success of ADR applied in the barangay. However, based on the, member of the members of the LUPON, there is no significant difference in the two variables in the three barangay. The data from the LUPON and the parties differed from each other. In light of the findings of the study, the following recommendations are given. For the local government unit, they may base on this study to reflect and gain knowledge on certain strategies to efficiently implement and improve ADR programs in their specific areas. For the Lupon Tagapamayapa, they should have a great extent of knowledge to look, investigate, and examine any disputes between the disputants. Also, they can use this study as a guide in evaluating how effective and efficient their system is when it comes to solving local disputes. For the parties, the parties that will undergo are currently undergoing and have undergone ADR program may put their full confidence in the Lupon Tagapamayapa since they are the experts in practicing and implementing the Katarungan Pambarangay Law, which holds all the guidelines of ADR mechanism at the barangay level. And lastly, for the future researchers, this can be used as a basis for future researchers who are studying the same research topic. The following are the references used in conducting this research. 
Thank you. A pleasant day to everyone. I am Mr. Winchester Canteras, together with my co-researchers, Ms. Abigail De Jesus and Mr. Ken Guarino, representing the School of Education. And we are here to proudly present our research entitled Content and Language Integrated Learning as a Tool in Developing Students' Skill in Writing an Expository Essay. The researchers observed several writing issues, mainly focusing on the students' expository essays, content, and structural issues. The mirror of the, of the problem was supported by Rizaldi at 2023, where he found out that generating ideas is one of the biggest problems of students in terms of writing an expository essay. This problem is needed to be addressed because students are expected to gain competence in writing essays as per DepEd Order Number 31, Series of 2020. The content and language integrated learning approach was utilized to address the said problem and to bridge the gap about writing intervention focusing on both educational trends and a practice-based approach. And now, here are the statements of the problem of this research. First, how did content and language integrated learning approach develop student skills in writing an expository essay? Second, what are the experiences of students in the utilization of content and language integrated learning approach? In order to give you an overview to the implemented intervention, here is a summary table. The intervention conducted was comprised of three major phases, which is also the teaching process of the lesson about their writing an expository essay. The first phase focused on the discussion of the writing of the introduction with the utilization of the student science lesson about the seasons in the Philippines as the material. The output of the student for this phase was the introduction of their expository essay about eclipses, which was also their lesson in the science class upon the implementation of the intervention. The second phase focuses on the writing of the body with the same topic as the material and the same topic as the output. The third phase focuses on writing the conclusion with the same topic as the material and the same topic as the output. After the three phases, the students were able to task to combine their outputs from the first phase up to the third phase to produce a complete expository essay about eclipses. So, okay, let us now discuss the methodology of this research. This research adapted the action research design, which according to George 2023, is used to provide immediate solution to a problem. Moving on to the participant of the study, a total of five students from grade seven, St. Clair, Ika East Campus were selected using a purposive sampling. These five participants were the students who scored 8 to 10 errors in their pre clil expository essay. So in order to gather the data needed for the study, the researchers sent a letter to conduct a research to the principal of ika East. As part of the student's output for fourth quarter, the researchers collected their expository essays prior to the implementation of the intervention. And after that, the reteaching process of writing an expository essay with a CLIL intervention was implemented. Students were again tasked to write an expository essay in line with their science lesson about eclipses. The last is the focus group discussion where an interview about the students' experiences took place. And after that, the data analysis process took place. The researchers used documentary analysis through coding sheets to analyze the development of students' writing skills. Um, moreover, thematic analysis through horizontalization was used to analyze the data from the focus group discussion. Let's now discuss the result of the study answering the SOP number one, which is how did content and language integrated learning approach develop students' skills in writing an expository essay? As you can see in the table, the first participant had a total of seven errors in his pre expository essay which were reduced to only three in his post clil expository essay. The positive development is also evident to participant two, who had a total of nine errors in her pre clil expository essay, and these errors were reduced to three in her post clil expository essay. Moreover, a development was also evident in participant three and also participant four. Next slide, please. They both had a total uh, of errors, of seven errors in their pre clil expository essay, which were reduced to only one in their post clil expository essay. For the fifth participant, who had a total of nine errors in his pre clil expository essay, and these errors were reduced to only three in his post clil expository essay. 
To validate the development of the students, let's now discuss the second part of the result of the study answering the SOP number two, which is what are the experiences of students in the utilization of content and language integrated learning approach? For this first theme, which is describing the topic based on their learning in science, students were able to introduce their topic in their essay introduction by basing on their lecture and their science class. These are some verbatim of the participants which supported Setuati 2018 findings that the most students used general background information to introduce a topic in an essay which the participants of our study were able to accomplish by basing on their science class. Next, please. Okay, so for the second theme, which is providing information from their science class, it highlighted the significant contribution of their science book in writing their expository essay. So these are some verbatim of the participants, which supported by SIPC and ZASMAR 2023 findings that utilizing suitable resources like books enhances the student's development of informative text writing skills. For the third theme, which is acquiring prior knowledge about the topic, Building prior knowledge and activating it have a pivotal role in enhancing and enriching the student's academic writing. Harvey in 2021 statement uh, stated that prior knowledge has a pivotal role in writing because students who know limited amount of information assigned to them experiences difficulty in writing about the topic. Next, please. Okay, so moving on to the last theme, which is learning both English and science in one activity. The students were able to reiterate that upon writing their expository essays, it feels like they are both studying English and science. This supports the findings of Deswila et al. 2020 in their study that the integration of language learning across the curriculum is an effective strategy to develop both students' use and learning of the English language. The findings presented the development of students' writing skills as well as their experiences upon the implementation of content and language integrated learning approach. Students develop focus on the errors they were able to avoid in writing their postal expository essays. Majority of the students were able to write their expository essays according to the standard rules of writing, such as providing a complete and interesting introduction, supplying accurate information in the body with the use of transitions, and it's and effectively summarizing all the details presented to the to their essay's conclusion. Moreover, the students were able to write effectively with the help of their discussion in their science lesson. Students acquired prior knowledge about the said topic in their science class, resulting to them getting information from their science lesson. This information was both used for their expository essay's introduction, body, and conclusion. The students reiterate that they feel they feel or they felt rather like they were studying and learning both science and english in one activity in order to further develop the students writing skills in english language teaching the researchers encourage english high school teachers to utilize the content and language integrated learning approach to integrating different lessons in their students other subjects in accordance with the curriculum the integration is advised to happen both in the writing discussion and activity of the students in addition Further researchers are encouraged to conduct further studies centralized on the possible intervention to help students in terms of developing skills in writing an expository essay. Here are the references of our study. And that's it. That's all for our research entitled Content and Language Integrated Learning as a tool in developing students' skill in writing an expository essay. Thank you and have a nice day. Okay. Good day, everyone. So our dear panelists and viewers, I greet you all a pleasant day today. I'm Josephine Lasse. Together with my research partner, Rebecca May Correa, we are from the School of Pharmacy. And through the guidance of our research mentor, Jacqueline San Gabriel, we are honored to present to you our thesis entitled COVID-19 Vaccine Literacy on Persons with Comorbidities in Baco or Cavite. Okay. So to introduce, vaccine literacy is based on the concept of health literacy, which defines as the ability of an individual to comprehend health information to make proper health decisions. So in 2019, the World Health Organization included vaccine hesitancy in 10 threats to global health. Studies show that vaccine hesitancy and vaccine literacy are linked to each other. 
While COVID-19 is also thought to proceed more quickly and severely in persons with comorbidities, evidence shows an emerging hesitancy among these people. And despite this, limited studies were conducted in the Philippines regarding this issue. Thus, these studies aim to evaluate the level of vaccine literacy among Filipinos with comorbidities. Okay, so this study is significant to the participants, the public, the healthcare professionals, the Department of Health, the Philippine Pharmacies Association, and to the future researchers. Okay, so for the conceptual framework, this study assessed the relationship between the participants' social demographic, which is the independent variable, and their vaccine literacy, which serves as the dependent variable. So specifically, this study aims to 1. Determine the social demographic profile of the participants. 2. Determine the level of their vaccine literacy in terms of vaccine literacy functional skills, their interactive or critical skills, opinions about vaccinations, COVID-19 vaccines attitudes, and current vaccines attitudes. And 3. To determine if there is a significant relationship between their social demographic and the vaccine literacy among them. Next, Baco or Cavite was chosen as the study site. 100 participants were included through quota sampling. The inclusion criteria include Filipinos aged 18 to 59 years old living in Baco or. On the other hand, frontline workers and senior citizens were excluded in the study. Okay, so the test questionnaire was adapted from the study of Yasha in 2021 and cited Italian adults likelihood of getting COVID-19 vaccine a second online survey. So the research process was successively done through the following, the ethics review, the validation of questionnaires, pilot testing, the reliability testing of questionnaires, data gathering, coding of data, then to data analysis. Okay, next, so this study underwent ethical review, informed consent was given to the participants, and all the data gathered were kept confidential. And that's all for the introduction and methodology. Ms. Correa will now take over from here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Lassie, for the presentation. Again, I am Rebecca Mekore from School of Pharmacy. Let's proceed to the presentation of the results. First table, most of the respondents are between 24 to 29 years old. Next table, more than half of the respondents are high school graduates. Next, uh, majority of the respondents are female. Next, majority of the respondents are non-government employees. It is presented based on age range to determine which age group has the most participants. Next, most of the comorbidities that are the respondents have include chronic respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and other comorbidities not included in the lists. It is presented based on the gender to determine which gender has the most participants. Next, let's proceed to the data of level of vaccine literacy. So for the first table, question one, Question 1 in the in this variable got the lowest weighted mean among the four questions. This result indicates that almost half of the respondents have sometimes or often encountered unfamiliar words when reading information about COVID-19 vaccine literacy. In general, all questions got slightly high vaccine literacy level having general weighted mean of 2.18. Next table represents the weighted mean of vaccine literacy in their active critical skills. As we notice, the slightly high vaccine literacy level interpretations are statement about how they consulted more than one source of information having to use and discuss to other people the information and consider the credibility of uh, sources whereas high vaccine literacy level interpretation are statement about the uh, sources of the information checking whether the information was correct and using the information to make a decision about vaccination having general assessment score 3.13 which is interpreted as slightly high vaccine literacy level. Next, in opinion about vaccination, the first statement got weighted mean of 3.37. The second statement got a weighted mean of 3.41. Next, in COVID vaccine attitude, the result shows that the majority of the respondents agreed that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. It is also noteworthy that majority are willing to get vaccinated and agreed to make COVID-19 vaccine mandatory for everyone and believe that children should also be vaccinated. However, majority believe that characteristic difference or characteristics of different vaccines do not overlap with each other. 67% uh, of the respondents uh, said that they would rather choose which vaccine to have, and 73% of the respondents are not willing to pay for the vaccine. Next, in current vaccine attitude, 
the result shows that majority are not yet vaccinated against seasonal flu and they are intended to get vaccinated in addition to seasonal influenza and COVID-19 vaccine. And the findings also shows that 53% of the respondents did not succeed, succeed in receiving other vaccine. Next, for the first table, it is found that there is a significant negative relationship between age and vaccine literacy, functional skill, and opinion about vaccination. This means that it, as people go, get older, their functional skill and opinion towards immunization decline. This result has a similarity to an international study by Sorensen et al. 2015, where it shows that as people get older, their health literacy declines. Next, for this table, the result shows that highest educational attainment has significant positive relationship with vaccine literacy, functional skill, uh, vaccine literacy, interactive critical skill, and opinion about vaccination. This implies that as one gets higher educational attainment, the higher their vaccine literacy, functional skills, and their active critical skills and opinion about vaccination. Given the significance of education in obtaining literacy, this fact is somewhat predictable. Next. Uh, for this table, the finding reveals that comorbidity has a significant negative relationship with interactive critical skills. This suggests that as the number of comorbidity increases, the vaccine, uh, vaccination literacy interactive critical skills decrease, uh, decrease. This is thought to indicate their inability to enhance their health literacy and vaccination literacy by taking necessary steps such as looking up information about COVID-19 vaccines and basic knowledge about their diseases. Next. For the correlation between social demographic and COVID-19 vaccine attitude revealed that sex, highest educational attainment, employment status, and comorbidity has significant relationship between COVID-19 vaccine attitude. Same with correlation between social demographic and current vaccine attitude. Next, in conclusion, social demographics, age, highest educational attainment, and comorbidity cor correlates with vaccine literacy, functional skills, and interactive critical skills and opinion. Social demographics such as sex, highest educational attainment, employment status, and comorbidity shows a significant relationship to COVID-19 vaccine attitude and current vaccine attitude. Overall, vaccine literacy, functional skills, interactive critical skills, and opinion associated with their social demographic profile, specifically their highest educational attainment. Comorbidity correlates with interactive critical skills, COVID-19 vaccine attitude, and current vaccine attitude. Age correlates with functional skills and opinion about vaccination. Uh, employment status and sex have significant relationship with COVID-19 and current vaccine attitude. For the recommendation, the researchers recommend a further study on a large sample size and wider scope of location to achieve a higher chance of general generalizability. Also, other it is recommended to explore more on other vaccine prior, priority groups, especially the senior citizen category, as they were found to have lower vaccine literacy than the lower ages. Furthermore, it is suggested that unemployment, monthly income status, and older age range be added as another variable for collecting demographic data from the fur, uh, from future respondents. The researchers would also like to propose this study as a reference due to the limitation of previous study on COVID-19 vaccination literacy in the Philippines. The researchers advise the, de uh, the Department of Health to continue to the promotion of COVID-19 vaccine in the country, as well as to establish more programs specific to persons with comorbidities to further improve their vaccine literacy. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you for listening. A pleasant day, everyone. I am Maria Janelle Sudaria from the School of Medical Technology, and I will be presenting our research study entitled In Vitro Activity of Biologically Synthesized Silver Nanoparticles by Esperi Kiholai Against Multidrug Resistant Biofilm Consortium Isolated from Sewage. We all know that sewage is a type of waste water, and as expected, microbial agents are present in there due to human and industrial waste that it carries. Biofilm Consortium is the main mode of microbial growth within water distribution systems, which can be affected by worsened pollution of water resources due to disposal of untreated or poorly treated wastewater. 
As highlighted by UNESCO in the year 2018, it is very alarming that there is 90% of untreated sewage being released directly into water bodies. In connection with one of the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, by the United Nations Development Program, which is Goal 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, it is a significant challenge to improve water quality, wastewater treatment, and safe reuse. The application of nanotechnology for water and wastewater treatment is recently developing and advancing globally. Nanomaterials such as silver nanoparticles, they possess enhanced absorption capacities to remove contaminants or pathogens from wastewater systems, including biofilm consortium, our growing communities of bacteria, and even multidrug resistant bacteria. Therefore, the present study was generally designed to evaluate the in vitro activity of biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles by Escherichia coli against multidrug resistant biofilm consortium isolated from sewage in a higher educational institution. Specifically, this study aims to first determine most probable number index of isolated bacteria from sewage, species isolated bacteria from sewage, determine the susceptibility of isolated bacteria to standard antibiotics, describe the escherichia-colized biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles, and lastly, compare the in vitro inhibition of multidrug resistant biofuel consortium using the following treatment concentrations of escherichia-colized biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles. The researchers started the experimentation with the collection of an untreated water sample from sewage in a higher educational institution. The sample was inoculated in laurel fructose broth, or LTB, for multiple tube fermentation technique and in violet red bile agar with lactose, or VRBL, which were incubated for 48 and 24 hours respectively. The LTB were examined for the presence of turbidity, acid, and gas production. Then, the most probable number of the positive LTB tubes were determined. The purified isolate in BHI broth was analyzed for automated identification and antimicrobial susceptibility testing of organisms using Vitec 2 Compact. Subsequently, the biosynthesis of silver nanoparticles was done by cultivating the dry augers land culture of Escherichia coli in Luria broth. After incubation, the produced biomass was centrifuged, then the supernatant and pellet were separated. An equal amount of pellet and 0.001 molar of silver nitrate aqueous solution were mixed and incubated for the production of silver nanoparticles. The incubated solution was sent to NASA labs to further characterize the biosynthesized silver nanoparticles through scanning electron microscopy or SEM. The in vitro activity of biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles was evaluated using in vitro biofilm inhibition in a microtiter plate. Serial dilution of isolate and silver nanoparticles was performed to come up with 60% and 80% concentrations of treatment. And the optical density of biofilm biomass was initially measured using a laser reader at 620 nanometer. And lastly, the optical density of biofilm formation was measured using a laser reader at 692 nanometer. For statistical tools, one-way ANOVA and post hoc analysis were used. Our findings on the presumptive identification of coliforms showed the presence of turbidity, acid, and gas formation, which determines the presence of coliforms in the sewage sample. These are similar to the study of Faturo and others in the year 2020. A total of 15 tubes were positive for the presence of coliforms and all of the tubes resulted with an infinite value of most probable number or MPN index, which is critical as it can be a public health risk. Additionally, the growth of multiple dark pink colonies was another indicator of the coliforms detected in the sewage sample. Using Vitec 2 Compact, there were multidrug resistant bacteria isolated from a sewage sample, specifically Morganella morgani, subspecies morgani, Klebsiella pneumoniae, subspecies pneumoniae, which was identified twice, Escherichia coli, which was also identified twice, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Some of the isolates were found to be resistant to some standard antibiotics, such as Morganella morgani, subspecies morgani, resistant to ampicillin, amoxicillin or clavulanic acid, cefuroxime, cefuroxime acetyl, and colistin. And for Klebsiella pneumoniae, subspecies pneumoniae, two isolates were resistant to ampicillin, and one isolate was resistant to ciprofloxacin. This finding is consistent with the study of Honor and others in the year 2018 wherein the isolated Morganella morgani from wastewater is resistant to ampicillin. Additionally, the study of Moges and others in the year 2014 demonstrated that Klebsiella species isolates from wastewater in hospital and non-hospital environments are resistant to ampicillin and ciprofloxacin. Through the use of 17 antibiotics, Morganella morgani subspecies morgani was found to be susceptible to 10 antibiotics intermediate to two antibiotics and resistant to five antibiotics. Klebsiella pneumoniae subspecies pneumoniae was susceptible to 14 antibiotics, intermediate to one antibiotic, and resistant to two antibiotics. Overall, Morganella morgani subspecies morgani showed the highest resistance among the six isolates. It was found to be 59% resistant to those antibiotics. 
On the other hand, Coxella pneumoniae subspecies pneumoniae was 12% resistant to antibiotics. The brown colored solution in the right means that there is biosynthesis of silver nanoparticles, unlike with the yellow colored solution on the left, which is the negative control. A color change from yellow to brown after incubation indicates successful biological synthesis of silver nanoparticles, according to Kushwaha and others in the year 2015. Figure 4 showed the diameter sizes of silver nanoparticles ranging from 33.61 to 263.20 nanometer and averagely 132.54 nanometer in size. Based on the LISA reading, these are the measured values in optical density of biomass and biofilm treated with various concentrations of silver nanoparticles. The optical density at 620 nanometer before the removal of biomass and the optical density result of all wells were greater than 1 except for the negative controls having a mean optical density of 0 0.740. The mean optical density value of biofilm without treatment was 0 0.312, while the mean optical density value of silver nanoparticles treated biofilm were 0 0.191 and 0 0.210 at 60 and 80% concentrations, respectively. The significant inhibition of biofilm growth was demonstrated by the decrease of optical density. As similarly reported by Seyo and others in the year 2021, the untreated biofilm has an optical density of 1.88, while upon the addition of greatest concentration and smallest concentration of silver nanoparticles, the optical density values declines to 0 0.7 and 1.61 respectively. Based on the results on one-way ANOVA in Table 7, there is significant difference in the optical densities of silver nanoparticles treated biofilm when compared to untreated biofilm with an F value of 34.111 and P value of 0 0.001. This is indicative of the ability of 60% and 80% silver nanoparticles to inhibit biofilm consortium in vitro. Moreover, based on post hoc analysis, using least significant difference, each of the group is significantly different from one another as shown in Figure 5. No treatment is significantly different from 60% silver nanoparticles, which has p-value of 0 0.000, and 80% silver nanoparticles, which has p-value of 0 0.001. However, both treatment concentrations of 60% and 80% are not significantly different with p-value of 0 0.267. After data analysis and interpretation of results, the researchers were able to find out that there was an infinite value for most probable number or MPN index of isolated bacteria from sewage in all replicates of positive tubes. In actuality, the following bacterial isolates were identified in the sewage sample, specifically Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Klebsiella pneumoniae subspecies pneumoniae, and Morganella morgani subspecies morgani. It was also determined that Morganella morgani subspecies morgani was resistant to ampicillin, amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, cefuroxime, cefuroxime acetyl, and colistin, while Klebsiella pneumoniae subspecies pneumoniae was resistant to ampicillin and ciprofloxacin. Meanwhile, Escherichia coli's biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles have shown diameter sizes ranging from 33.61 to 263.20 nanometer and averagely 132.54 nanometer. In the final analysis, the researchers were able to conclude that 60% and 80% concentrations of silver nanoparticles are evident in antibiofilm activity. Therefore, the silver nanoparticles biologically synthesized by Escherichia coli can inhibit the formation of multidrug-resistant biofilm consortium in vitro. Based on the findings of the study, the researchers would like to suggest the following. First, biologically synthesize silver nanoparticles using different microorganisms and compare their activity against biofilm formation. Individually assess the activity of silver nanoparticles against the biofilm formation of each identified bacterial isolate. Further, discover the activity of silver nanoparticles against mature biofilm. Examine the surface of biofilm treated with silver nanoparticles through electron microscopy. And lastly, further study the viability of biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles. And that ends the presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Together, let us utilize the advancement of nanotechnology to address other public health issues. Good day, Good members day. of the panel. I am Maria Lisa L. Remo. And I am Angela Perez. And I am John Leonard Dimacali. And we are the members of Group 1. Today, we will be presenting our study entitled Measurement of the Health-Related Components of Physical Fitness of Emilio Aguilar College Cavite Students After the Two-Year Online Learning Period, a Descriptive Cross-Sectional Study. To start off, we are going to discuss the brief background of the study and the RRL. 
Restrictions implemented to limit the spread of COVID-19 resulted in a change in providing education, which shifted to the remote learning from face-to-face -face classes. Chad proposed the online class setup as a way to continue the learning process of the students in the middle of the global pandemic. The transition to an online-based education resulted in a decreased physical activity of students, which caused their health status to deteriorate. The student's lifestyle was affected, affected, resulting in decreased engagement in physical activity and unhealthy weight gain. A decline in fitness level was observed upon implementation of online classes, which resulted in decreased flexibility, muscle strength, pulmonary function, and cardiovascular endurance. The purpose of this study is to establish baseline data for the current health-related fitness components level of SPTRE students at EACC after the two-year online learning program. These were answered through the following objectives. To measure the cardiorespiratory fitness, body composition, flexibility, muscular strength, and muscular endurance, and to determine the subgroups within the SPTRE who would need recommendations for specific preventive strategies relating to the results of their health-related fitness components. The diagram above shows the health-related components of physical fitness of students who underwent two-year online classes. As physical class setup begins to be reinstated in the Philippines, the documentation of deleterious impacts of online class set on health-related components of physical fitness appears to be insufficient. Thus, the researchers aim to measure the current status of the student's health-related components of physical fitness using body composition, flexibility, cardiorespiratory endurance, muscle strength, and endurance. The researchers do not intend to establish the relationship amongst all health-related components of physical fitness, hence the variables in the diagram do not overlap. The paper will only cover health-related components of physical fitness. Skill-related components should be excluded from this study. Also, other students enrolled in other colleges and universities are not within the scope of the research. The findings of this research identify the need to propose specific preventive strategies which may facilitate educational professionals to develop effective health promotion programs on the wellness of students enrolled in the EACC. Also, other higher educational institutions will have better understanding of the impacts of sedentary lifestyle among students, which may also urge them to be more proactive in promoting a well-being of their primary stakeholders. This study may also raise awareness of students regarding their health, which could motivate appropriate lifestyle adjustment after prolonged confinement in their own homes. Lastly, for future researchers, this study will be a useful guide in conducting similar research and serve as a baseline for future studies. To further understand the context of the research paper, the term shown will be defined. Cutoff point. This refers to the level at which the participant's scores fall under the average or lower. Majority. This refers to the group of participants who had the highest total number amongst all components but did not reach half of the total population. And then lastly, most. This refers to the group of participants who had the highest total number of amongst all part components and reached greater than half of the total population. Locally, there is a lack of available studies that investigate the deleterious impacts of online classes on the health-related components of fitness that may be existing in the Philippines. All of these problems were ad addressed through the following methods. Researchers utilized a descriptive cross-sectional study to establish baseline data for the current health-related fitness components level of SPTRE students of EACC after the two-year online learning period. This research design was utilized in order to evaluate variables with large sample sizes and show higher statistical power. This study will only involve college students of EECC school year 2022 to 2023 who experience a two year learning period. Concomitantly, students have existing under some lower extremity and pulmonary conditions will be excluded. The calculated sample size of 150 students was gathered and the researchers applied a stratified random sampling method. Proportional sampling was utilized to the SPTRE population that is made up of multiple subgroups with significant differences in number. The amount of participants per subgroup was determined by their proportion in the overall population. Table 1 shows that most of the participants are from BS Physical Therapy Program, 
which are mostly 18 to 19 years old and majority are first year students. Most of the participants were females and were found to live in house with family members. Majority of the participants were endomorph with an average income level of approximately 21,000 to 44,000. The data gathering was divided into three phases. During the pre-recruiting phase, the researchers hired an assessor to evaluate the health-related components. The researchers explained the physical fitness tool and protocol to the assessor. A copy of the protocol was also given. Rater training and pilot testing was conducted the same day. Recruitment phase, the master list of the college students was, recorded, was requested from the registrar. The, the researchers sent letters to the school to say formally conducting of the research. Upon approval, consent form and screening pool was distributed to the participants prior to the day of the implementation. For the implementation of testing, the implementation took three days. Vital sensors were taken for precautionary purposes. Then the participants were subject to six stations. Upon finishing the stations, participants received food and beverages as refreshments for participating in the study. The researchers measured the participants' BMI because of its test pre test and Pearson correlation coefficient reliability are found to be very high. At the same time, the interclass reliability of this metric was considered to be highly reliable. For upper extremity, the researchers used zipper test, which was found to be a reliable and valid test in measuring overall shoulder range of motion for adults. Also, the researchers implemented sit and reach test to assess the hamstring flexibility. It is recommended because of its moderate criterion related validity in terms of estimating the extensibility of hamstring muscle. On the other hand, the three-minute step test was used to evaluate the cardiorespiratory fitness, which was a good tool with good validity and practicality. Push-up test was used by the researchers to assess the dynamic muscle strength and the interrater validity was found to be very high. Clank test was used to measure muscle endurance. It is recommended because it had a strong test in the reliability. The researchers heard the statistician for the data treatment. The values of health-related components and demographics will be expressed as data statistics to provide basic information regarding the current status of the health-related components of physical fitness. Gathered data was, were tabulated and computed for the frequency, mean, range, and standard deviation with regard to the trend and demographics of the participants. Prior to the implementation of the study, the researchers sought permission from the Ethical Review Committee of EACC. Additionally, all of the participants were asked to sign an informed consent to ensure that they read and understood the foregoing information. Their participants was also purely voluntary and they are free to withdraw at any point of the study if they wish to do so. Table 2 presents the descriptive statistics that shows the current level of health-related fitness components of SPTRE students from EACC. In body composition, the majority of the participants were found to have normal BMI. Meanwhile, in flexibility of the left and right upper extremity, most of the participants were found to have poor zipper test scores. For the flexibility of the lower extremity, the majority of the participants were graded as good in sit and reach test. And most of the participants scored very poorly in cardiorespiratory fitness in the 3-minute step test. And in terms of muscle strength, the majority of the participants need improvement in the push-up test. Lastly, in muscle endurance, most of the participants scored excellent in plank test. Table 3 presents the summary of the participants who did not meet the cutoff score in the test, measured health which measures the health-related fitness components. Most of the participants who did not meet the cutoff scores were found to be Fourth-year female RT students ages from 22 to 23 years old with endomorph body. This study presents baseline data on the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown on the health-related physical fitness components of SPTRE students of the ACC. Up to this date, it is one of the first to measure and investigate the deleterious changes of online classes within the context of the pandemic that may be existing in the future. EACC students and other HEIs should recognize the factors that contribute to the problem and enforce specific preventive strategies, implement static and dynamic stretching routines, 
teachers students have proper ergonomic settings at home or at school, incorporate body weight exercises or resistance training, integrate simple physical activities into daily living, and administer routine physical fitness testing per semester. For future researchers of the study, could consider the perspective and experiences of participants from other schools and further investigate the correlation of the baseline health-related components with the demographics. And that concludes the presentation of our study. Thank you for listening. Good day, everyone. We are the group from Young QS the Ticket Q Dispensing Robot with the proponents, Ms. Baltazar, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Paginto, Mr. Kilo, all college students from Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite, School of Engineering and Technology. Next. People encounter a variety of cues, some of which move quickly while others appear to linger indefinitely and disrupt the entire day. Next. What distinguishes a decent waiting experience from a horrible one is not simply the pace of the queue, but how it affects our emotions and the fairness of the line we have may have significant influence on our impression than the duration of the wait. Next. The digitalization of this procedure, which skewing should make the overall experience simpler and easier for the customers, according to Malapo 2022. And according to Vail Sherry, kiosk machine sales are expected to triple between 2021 and 2028. While C et al. found that kiosk machine is the best way to place an order at a certain McDonald's fast food chain at 54.6% of the surveys, 232 respondents preferred using kiosk machines. Thus, <coughs> the studies, the researchers decided to develop a centralized modern queuing system with a kiosk interface. Next. Which encompasses our general objectives, which is to develop a ticket queue dispensing robot that is able to provide a queuing ticket and sequential instructions for the required business of college students and parents or guardians with on-site college-related transactions with EACC or Emilio Aguinaldo College Cavite. Next. So for dissecting this general objective are the specific objectives, which is number one, design an automated queuing system by incorporating existing on-site procedures of continuing college student enrollment and school document requests. Next, develop a queue, the kiosk-based automated queuing system for the institution stakeholders. Evaluate the automated queuing system in accordance with the software product quality of ISO IEC 25010 of 2011 in terms of functional suitability, performance efficiency, usability. Next, evaluate the robotic arm in accordance with the NISTR 8177 robotic performance key performance indicator, which are position accuracy, position repeatability, job execution time. Next is identify the advantages and disadvantages of using an automated queuing system through the use of a word cloud. Next. Figure one shows the conceptual framework of the study that's in the form of input, process, and output. For, for a generalized view of our IPO system, so input is where the information is all being fed into the system, while the process uh, which undergoes uh, certain steps in sequential instruction how to process that data, while the output is our prototype, which is a centralized queuing system. Next, please. For methodology, Mr. Kilo. So thank you. A pleasant day to the chairs and observers of IMRC. So we are now in the second part of methodology, which is the research design. So in our study, we used a waterfall method wherein it is a sequential method that flows from first stage first and up to the last stage so we have five stage here which is the requirements design implementation verification and maintenance next piece so for the research design of the requirements we have here the hardware next the software the duration which is a four months and cost is estimated to fifty thousand pesos and the risks are minimal and the software dependency is relied to the user's input of education institution eacc next piece so for the design of our robotic uh, kiosk, we have here the following dimensions. Next. So we used the galvanized iron as a primary material. And for the robotic arm, we used a aluminum. And we have here six MG996 arm motors. And we used the a Arduino R3. Next, please. So for the implementation, we used here a Apache HTTP server, which is the uh, a PHP 
HTML, CSS, JS, and SQLite. So for our for robotic arm, we use Arduino Uno R3, and it will be connected to the USB serial port. And then for the queuing system, we will use the hybrid first come first serve plus P priority queue or FCFS P plus PQ algorithm. Next, please. So for the research design implementation, this is the software side wherein we have here the main page for the home page of the kiosk, and there's the the second picture is all about the kiosk about the enrollment model. So wherein the users will input the user um, student number and then the priority and next queue. So in the next photo, we have here the queuing ticket layout wherein it uh, shows the print layout of the queuing receipt will be provided by the kiosk. So for the verification, it is the testing and or verification that incurs that all criteria have been met. So we're in this stage wherein we will conduct alpha testing and beta testing, which will be further discussed in the results and discussion. So for the research design and maintenance, it is the once the product is released and the users begin to using it. So this stage co concludes wherein the users are delighted or continue if they require frequent updates. Next, please. So for the sources of data, we have here the 135 was college students. So this is from only from Bachelor of Science of Computer Engineering at EAC Cavite. It's from the second semester of the academic year 2022 to 2023. So for the sampling technique, uh, the researchers utilize the convenient sampling. Next, please. So here are the uh, summary of our data analysis, which wherein we used sample mean, interpretation of mean scores, Slobin's formula to get the respondents, and the Cornbox Alpha to test the reliability of the, our um, uh, software and hardware, and then interpretation of Cornbox Alpha reliability, and then interpretation of binary rating scales to the uh, beta testing, and then descriptive analysis for the comments and suggestions of our, of our respondents. Next, please. So for the results of our study, uh, we have here Mr. Johnson. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Nico. So for our results of the study, uh, this table presents the overall evaluation of the 20 APA uh, testing respondents regarding the software part of survey questionnaire in accordance with ISO slash IEC 250-10 of 2011. The aggregated mean score of three characteristics has a total of 5.31. And a mean score of 5.31 indicates that the respondents strongly agree that the, st the study system is able to function properly, perform task efficiently, and is user-friendly. So the table two shows the software results of Comeback APA, and the number of items of the survey is, is 11, and the sum of the variance is 9.9. .9. Therefore, the total alpha coefficient is 0 0.62, meaning this number is acceptable. And for table three, it is a present, presents the evaluation of 115 beta testing respondents regarding to the software product quality which is the three characteristics of functional stability, performance efficiency, and usability. And the mean score of this is 5.46, and 5.46 means an indication of strongly agree. Here in the table 4 shows the observation performance between 300 tests split into two days, performed for eight hours each. Regarding the robotic arms performance outlined in the NISTIR 8177 robot performance key performance indicator which evaluates the robotic arm based on three specific characteristics position accuracy position rep repeatability and total and total and interpretation job execution time which has a um, total value of 25.28 or 0 0.9947 which means very high in here we have uh, another result of a study where we have used word cloud result. Uh, this figure presents the positive comments and the suggestions we stood out. It includes good, line, speed, improvement, speed, student, arm, better option, Q, gripper, and easier. Well, the word primary highlights the advantages of Myong QS. It also offers insights to the potential areas for further improvement or further development of our uh, thesis. This word li words like adjust, need, option, prevent, properly, reset, resetting, and suggest and indicating that respondents have constructive ideas for enhancing the system. These suggestions are related to the functionality, user interface, or specific features that could be implemented or refined. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. For the conclusion and recommendations of uh, Myong.QS, the ticket uh, Q dispensing robot. Myong.QS, the ticket Q dispensing robot, is successfully designed and developed 
by the proponents from the web application database robotic arm and hardware thoroughly evaluated through the survey questionnaires and robotic arm testing in accordance with the specific characteristics from ISO 25010 of 2011 and ISTIR 8177. Myung.QS garnered a total mean score of 5.46. Uh, from the software evaluation, lastly, um, uh, Myung.QS robotic arm required a total mean of 0.9947 of the position accuracy and the position repeatability in an average of 25.28 seconds of the queuing ticket distributions. And for the recommendations, these future researchers may utilize a proximity sensor and text-to-speech capability along with the speakers, integrate uh, additional business transactions and an administration offices to the system, explore possibly integrating the automated queuing system with the school's existing database system, and lastly, to enclose the robotic arm in a casing. Next, please. So these are the references of the uh, study. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you for listening for uh, Myong.QS, the ticket queue dispensing robot. Everyone, I am Trisha Mikilisa, and together with my member, um, Rochelle and Zikovia, we are here to present our research entitled The Relationship Between Employees' Performance and Customer Satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort. Actually, this research is a quantitative type of research, wherein in the study, we aim to determine the significant relationship between those two variables the employee's performance and the customer satisfaction. Aside from that, this aims to identify the contribution of the employee's performance to the services in order to gain the satisfaction of the customers and how this satisfies the guests. So for the next slide, okay, yeah. So for that next slide, or in this slide, you can see the amenities that Fullness has from the pool itself, rooms, facilities, restaurants, and lobbies. So this is the pictures taken in the um, Bolas Hotel and Resort, and we are the one who took that pictures when we conduct the study. So that's all. Now let's discuss the introduction. The purpose of this study is to determine the relationship between employees' performance and customer satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort. Next is the statement of the problem. Number one is what is the demographic profile of the respondents in terms of age, gender, occupation, and number of visit. Second is what is the level of customer satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort in terms of accommodation, amenities, facilities, and beverages. Third is what is the level of employees' performance months in Bullets Hotel and Resort in terms of learning and growing ability, application and responsibility, communication skills, and performance. Lastly is, is there a significant relationship between employees' performance and customer satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort? For our Nile hypothesis on this study is that there is no significant relationship between employees' performance and customer satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort. Our significance of the study first is for the management to the hotels, the tourism, and hospitality businesses, the employees, customers, and tourism students, and the professor, and to our institution, and to the future researchers. Next is the scope and limitations. This study will be focused on determining the relationship between employees' performance and customer satisfactions. In the sample size of this survey, it will be limited for the 100 participants. 
So now, let's proceed with the chapter 2. The chapter 2 contains the methodology of the study, which in, in, this research, um, in the research design, we use correlational research design, which uses statistical method to provide analysis and interpretation of data that will perform statistical analysis since we use the survey questionnaires to determine those two variables, the relationship between the employee's performance and the customer satisfaction in the studies. And also, the participants of the studies are the customers and supervisors of Bolet's Hotel and Resort. So the questionnaires, questionnaires are divided into the two sections. And aside from that, after gathering the information from the respondents, we compiled and tabulated all data to determine the validity and I'm sorry, reliability using the formula of percentage, mean, and Pearson correlation coefficient, which helped us to measure those two variables. And now we will be discussing the results on this chapter 3. So for the first one table, the demographic profile of the respondents. In terms of age, we can see here on this figure that 46 of our respondents came from 18 to 27 years old. Next is the sex. We can see that having a 55% of our respondents came from female. Next one is for occupation. Most of our respondents has, uh, which is employed. And lastly, for the number of visit, we can see that 45% um, of our respondents having a first time visit at Wallet's Hotel and Resort. Next one is the level of customer satisfaction. So for the first table, which is the respondent's perspective on the level of customer satisfaction in terms of accommodation, having a composite mean of 2.7340. This one table is the respondent's perspective in terms of amenities, having a composite mean of 2.9.0. Next is the respondent's perspective in terms of facilities. With, by this one, it has a composite mean of 2.9680. Lastly, um, the respondent perspective in terms of food and beverages that has a mean of 2.8640. For the next one, interpretation is the level of employee's performance. As we can see here on the first table, respondent's perspective of, on level of employee's performance in terms of learning and growing ability that has a composite mean of 3.83, which second is the respond, respondent's perfect perspective in terms of obligation and responsibility that has a mean of 3.83 also. Third um, table, we can see the respondent's perspective on the level of employee's performance in terms of communication skills that has a mean of 3.33. For the last one is the respondent's perspective in terms of performance of the employees, which has a composite mean of 3.66. Next is the significant relationship between employee's customer satisfaction and employee's performance. We can see here the correlation for each variable in terms of satisfaction using the Pearson correlation coefficient R. Uh, we can see that the significant relationship between customer satisfaction and employee's performance for the table 3.5.2, that there is a correlation for each variable in employee's performance using Pearson's R. Okay, so for the last chapter, the chapter 4, chapter 4 is the discussion which presents the interpretation, the conclusions, the recommendation, the references, and appendices of the entire study. After gathering the entire data and coming up with all the conclusions, we, the researchers, found out that there was a relationship between those two variables, which are the employee's performance and the customer satisfaction in Bullets Hotel and Resort. And um, actually, the decision has been rejected after gathering the data and with the use of survey questionnaire, of course. And that's how we come up with the conclusion that they have a relationship with each other. And also, this demonstrates that the majority of resorts guests are satisfied with the accommodation, the amenities, the facilities, and the food and beverages, which um, those four or those um, amenities, the facilities, accommodation, and food and beverages are included in our statement of the problem. Aside from that, the results of employees' performance shows that the employees at Wallace Hotel and Resort are outstanding, 
according to their supervisors. Since their supervisors is the one who answered those questionnaires regarding for the employee's performance. And we also revealed in the study that the employee performance influences customer satisfactions, which implies that um, if there is a high level of employee performance, there is also a high level of customer satisfaction as well. So at the end of this research, as a researcher, we got a life lessons of um, resorts are helping clients and clients was helping the resorts as well. And in the end, we are all have a relationship, not just by the study that we conducted, but in real life. As all of us, customers, employees, and businesses was just connected with each other. So, um, I hope you guys learn about from our research and you read about it so you can be able to know what is the and um what is the research or what is our study and that's all we hope that you gain more knowledge and information about um the study that we conducted that's all and have a great day presenting the certificate of recognition to the chosen school's best thesis for the academic year 2022 to 2023. Best thesis from the School of Arts and Sciences, a case study on burnout recovery associated with remote teaching of professors at Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite. Best thesis from the School of Respiratory Therapy, Accessibility of healthcare among the residents of Barangay Wutri, Wawa, Rosario, Cavite, towards the management of upper respiratory tract infection in young adulthood. Best thesis from the School of Criminology, Alternative Dispute Resolution, a key to peace and order in the Barangay level. Best thesis from the School of Education, Content and Language Integrated Learning, as a tool in developing student skill in writing an expository essay. Best thesis from the School of Pharmacy, COVID-19 Vaccine Literacy on Persons with Comorbidities in Bacoor, Cavite, a quantitative study. Best thesis from the School of Medical Technology, in vitro activity of biologically synthesized silver nanoparticles by Escherichia coli, against formation of multidrug-resistant biofilm consortium isolated from sewage. Best thesis from the School of Physical Therapy. Measurement of health-related fitness components of physical and respiratory therapy students from Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite after the two-year online learning period. A descriptive cross-sectional study. Best thesis from the School of Engineering, Computer Science, and Technology. Myong.QS, the Ticket Queue Dispensing Robot. And the best thesis from the School of Tourism and International Hospitality Management. The relationship between employees' performance and customer satisfaction in Volets Hotel and Resort. And without further ado, I am honored to announce the winners of the Academic Year 2022 the 2023 Student Research Colloquium. Let's start with third place under the descriptive category. The authors, Princess Jessica Feliza P. Adriano, Jinx Mikey A. Balibalos, John Daniel R. Go, and Joanna T. Manpol, with their thesis titled, A Case Study on Burnout Recovery, associated with remote teaching of professors at Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite, from the School of Arts and Sciences. And Vincent Andrew Bereda, Ken Trapson Candolesas, Trisha May Quiliza, and Trishel Ann Segovia, with their thesis titled, The Relationship Between Employees' Performance and Customer Satisfaction in Volets Hotel and Resort, from the School of Tourism and International Hospitality Management. Second place for the descriptive category. The authors, Winchester M. Canteras, Abigail M. De Jesus, and Ken M. Guarino, with their thesis title, Content and Language Integrated Learning, 
as a tool in developing student skill in writing an expository essay. From the School of Education. Also, Rebecca May Correa and Jessa Faith P. Lasse with their thesis title, COVID-19 Vaccine Literacy on Persons with Comorbidities in Bacoor, Cavite, a Quantitative Study from the School of Pharmacy. And Angelica Nicole Perez, Akia Luisa Remo, and John Leonard de Macay with their thesis titled, Measurement of Health-Related Fitness Components of Physical and Respiratory Therapy Students from Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite, after the two-year online learning period, a descriptive cross-sectional study from the School of Physical Therapy. And the undergraduate thesis for the academic year 2022 to 2023 under the descriptive category goes to the authors Christian Faye Alvarez, Lance Christian Carriedo, Christian Venerde de Guzman, Margie Rivera, and Corinne Ann Sarabia with their thesis titled Alternative Dispute Resolution, A Key to Peace and Order in the Barangay Level from the School of Criminology. Second place for the experimental category. The authors, Dronchenet Emerlyn M. Baltazar, John Noah G. Johnson, Irvin Matthew Paginto, and Nico Angelo P. Kilo, with their thesis title, Myong.QS, The Ticket Queue Dispensing Robot, from the School of Engineering, Computer Science, and Technology. And the undergraduate thesis for the academic year 2022 to 2023 under the experimental category goes to the authors Christian Angelo Batalier, Ivan Josh Del Rosario, Mary Estrada, Romir Jan Posadas, Roby Erin Ceylon, and Maria Janelle Sudaria with their thesis title In Vitro Activity of Biologically Synthesized Silver Nanoparticles by Eshrikea Kolai Against Formation of Multidrug Resistant Biofilm Consortium Isolated from Sewage from the School of Medical Technology. Congratulations to all the student researchers! To close this program, let us all welcome Dr. Brandon G. Sibaluka, the Director of the Research and Development Office. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This undergraduate research colloquium with the team EAC at 50 Celebrating Lives of Excellence, Service, and Virtue has been incredibly inspiring and as we end, I feel a tremendous amount of pride and appreciation. Our student researchers today put on a stunning display of intelligence, curiosity, and dedication, bringing a variety of backgrounds and viewpoints to the fore. It is incredibly encouraging to see how their efforts have advanced our knowledge of virtue, service, and excellence. Throughout this colloquium, we have traversed a landscape of ideas and insights that span across disciplines, reflecting the richness and complexity of the challenges facing our society today, from psychology to engineering, from philosophy to health sciences. Our presenters have demonstrated the power of collaboration and interdisciplinary exploration in addressing these challenges. Excellence. The pursuit of one's highest potential has been a recurring theme in the research presented today. It reminds us of the dedication, perseverance, and a commitment of continual improvement. Service, the act of giving back to our communities and making a positive impact on the world, has also shown brightly in our discussion this morning. The research presented here is not just an intellect exercise, it is a testament to the power of knowledge to effect change. Our undergraduate researchers have shown us that service is not limited to a single field or profession. It is also a universal principle that transcends boundaries. And finally, virtue the moral and ethical foundation that guides our actions, has been explored in depth in our various contexts. 
The pursuit of virtue is a reminder that our work as researchers does not exist in isolation but is intertwined with our responsibility to make ethical decisions and contribute to the greater good. As we conclude this colloquium, I encourage each of you to take away more than just the knowledge imparted today. Let this event serve as a catalyst for your own journey towards excellent service and virtue. Let it inspire you to embrace the interdisciplinary nature of knowledge and the limitless potential of collaboration. Let it remind you that research, no matter how specialized, can have a profound impact on society. I want to extend my heartfelt congratulations to all the presenters for their outstanding work, as well as to their mentors, families, and friends who have supported them on this journey. Your dedication and hard work have not gone unnoticed. Let's not forget that virtue, excellence, and service are not only ideas, but also guiding principles that can help us achieve a better future. As we leave this colloquium, let us apply these concepts to our academic endeavors, our professional lives, and our personal lives. By combining diverse research, we may create a world that is characterized by wisdom, compassion, and long-lasting effects. I appreciate your participation in this wonderful event and look forward to seeing the incredible contributions that each of you will make in the years to come. Once more, congratulations and may your travel be marked by virtue, service, and excellence.